Okay, we are continuing in the discussion of the Open Fellowship Movement and the way that brethren are making agreements and uh, the things that we accept and things that we go along with, things that we lay hands to. And in fine, we're looking at the arguments that people make espousing what they call reality um, appeals to what people think and what people are doing and what you can see happening around you. And while sometimes those things are not what they should be, um, we nonetheless are called to look at God and his word as the standard, not the behavior of those around us. We are taking warnings from Numbers 16 or thereabouts, talking about Korah and his band and the destruction that they wrought, because these are wholesale the same arguments that people advance today in defense of their way of making fellowship. And what you found there was an accusation from them you have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey. There was a promise that they were leaving Egypt in order to go to a land that flows with milk and honey. And they did. They did leave Egypt to do that. They set out for that. How did we get to here in uh, number 16 where Korah and his band have stood up against Moses? Again, they said, you've not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, Numbers 16, 14, nor given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Will you put out the eyes of these men? The meaning of this statement, will you put out the eyes of these men, is look around you. We can see where we are. We can see what's happening. Or, as Ed Harrell said, reality compels us. That's the thing. What I would like for you to think about is that the thing that should be compulsive or uh, that compels you is the Bible. What people are doing is irrelevant to whether or not a thing is true. What people are doing is irrelevant with regard to what does God want. That's not the standard. That's not how you find out what God wants you to do. Here, their accusation is, look around, we are in a desert. We are not in a land flowing with milk and honey. Who are we supposed to believe? You or our own eyes? That's what they're saying. So the question is, how did we get here? And the reason for asking how did we get here is, it's true they are not in a land flowing with milk and honey. That's correct. And if you look about, they are in a desert and things are not very good. But why? And why is Korah coming up like this and attacking the Levitical priesthood? We looked a, a while back at the clarity of the Bible where we could, we could see plainly that God did choose the Levites and God did choose Aaron and his sons. And there was no ambiguity about this, and there was no question. It was perfectly clear. That's not the issue. Why then are they arising at this point? And how long have they been in the desert? And how long have they been walking with Moses and Aaron at the helm? Which is really the Lord at the helm. You've got to understand what happens in number 16 when Korah and, and his ilk stand up and say, everybody can be priests, not just Aaron and Levi. When they stand up and say that, it's in this context, the larger context of, why are they where they are right now? It's because 
when the Lord sent the spies out, or well, Moses sent the spies out into the promised land, and the spies came back, they brought an evil report and discouraged the people, and the people in their discouragement and their fear and their despair rebelled and would not go into the promised land flowing with milk and honey. When they could not go into the promised land, then did God curse that generation. So for them to come by or come back a couple of chapters later and say, well, look around. We're not in the land flowing with milk and honey is pretty extremely tone deaf. We're not in the land of milk and honey because you refuse to go to the land of milk and honey. That's why it's not because Moses and Aaron take too much on themselves. So think about it this way, right over there in Numbers 13. It's 27 to 31. The spies came back and said, We came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey indeed. This is its fruit. And you remember, they, you may remember, they had um, one of the clusters of grapes that was, you know, the size of a full-grown man. They were carrying it on a pole between them, you know, over the shoulders between them. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and large. Besides that, we saw the descendants of Anak there. That means giants, very large people. Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, the Negev. Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites in the hill country all around. Canaanites by the sea and along the Jordan. So they said, it does flow with milk and honey. Its fruit is hard to believe. We brought some back. But the people are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. And they, were, they even have champions. These giants, if you will. One of the spies, Caleb, quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Caleb is correct. That's what they should have done. So the report comes back and says, It does flow with milk and honey, but it is a monstrosity to try and attack. There are so many people. They are so large. They have cities. Right? And here we are, this wandering group of families in the desert. But Caleb said, let's go up immediately and occupy it. The men who had gone up with him, though, said, we are not able to go up against the people. We, they are stronger than we are. So this is the argument. Two of the spies out of the twelve, Caleb and Joshua, brought back, you know, the facts as the facts are. Facts are friendly. But they brought back an encouraging word saying, let's go get them. It does flow with milk and honey. There are large cities for us to dwell in. Let's go take them. The Lord has given it to us. But ten out of the twelve spies did not say this. They said, we cannot go up against the people. They are stronger than we are. We won't win. And of course, you can see that there's a basic difference between them. Um, not just that, you know, they have a difference of opinion about what to do in this situation. The basic difference is that Caleb and Joshua are ordering their lives and making decisions according to what cannot be seen. They see the unseen, that God is with them, and they can overcome because God is with them despite their own frailties or personal failings. God is the one who fights the battles, which you have seen already. 
This is the generation that left Egypt, remember. They're the ones who saw the plagues. They're the ones who saw the Red Sea stand up and part so that they could walk through as on dry land. It's this generation. These are the people who did that. They know what God can do. Or they should. But it continues in Numbers 14. All the congregation at that point raised a loud cry. And the people wept that night. So they are persuaded by the ten. And in the fourth verse, they said to one another, Let's choose a leader and go back to Egypt. We've come this far, but no further. We sent spies into the land. The land is a beautiful land, but we can't take it. We don't have the power. So let's choose a leader and go back to Egypt. This is already a problem, isn't it? Because Moses is the one God chose to be the leader, and they've thrown that off. They know he's not going to go back to Egypt. And why go back to Egypt? Things were not great in Egypt. They were making bricks. They didn't have straw. They were supposed to expose their male infants to death. That wasn't great back there. In Hebrews 11, 15, in, in, maybe in your mind, which says if they had been thinking of that land from which they'd gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. That's true. The people of faith, we who believe in God, who trust in his power to save, not in our own power, we have opportunity to go back to sin, to go back to the world. If you, you know, if you'd been thinking of the land from which you have already come out, there's opportunity to return. You can do it, but don't continue in the faith and be strong and, and take the land that God has promised. Now, the rest of this in Numbers 14. Uh, is very important. Six through ten. Joshua, son of Nun, Caleb, son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes, which is what you do in a great mourning and distress, and said to the congregation of the people of Israel, the land which we pass through to spy it out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land. He will give it to us as well. And that is our strategy. That is still our strategy as the people of God today. We do not think that we are going to change this world with our numbers, whether it's numbers of people or dollars or bricks or IQ points or whatever. Charisma, intelligence, dexterity, whatever you got. That is not what's going to be the winning thing. It is God. If he delights in us, then he will grant the blessings. So our job is to delight the Lord to do what pleases him so that he is on our side that he supports us and then our enemies cannot stand before us right this is the correct philosophy this is the correct approach the faithful live that way they're not looking at the numbers they're not looking at the physical implementation, the odds. They are looking at the God who commanded, trusting that he can deliver us. And our job is to be faithful to him. All these other things that are not in our control and cannot be controlled, frankly, by us, can be managed by God. If we will be 
persistent in pleasing him. That's the strategy. The rest of this is what they said, only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land. They are bread for us. <laughs> we will just gobble this up. It, it's only there to feed us. Don't rebel. Don't fear the people of the land. Their protection is removed from them. The Lord is with us. Do not fear them. So, yeah, they, they seem to be powerful, but it doesn't matter when God is the one who's fighting. Nobody has enough power to counter the Lord. But the 10th verse of Numbers 14, the response of the congregation is, we need to stone Caleb and Joshua. Stone them with stones. That was the response. You hear the words of Joshua and Caleb saying, the land is exceedingly good. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us in and give it to us. Just don't rebel. Don't fear the people. Their protection is removed. The Lord is with us. This is worthy of death? Why is that worthy of death? Well, it's worthy of death because they're walking by faith. They are relying on God. They're going up against something that, you know, in human mind, human way of thinking, that's impossible. They're thinking you have um, uh, conscribed us to death. And we have no choice but to die if we try to beat these people. We can't beat them. You're being unrealistic. See, that's people and their appeals to reality. That's unrealistic. You can't expect, hey, what can't you expect? God raises the dead. Yes, you can expect that God will do the things that he said he will do. And yes, we can overcome and we will if the Lord delights in us. That's worthy of death to the unfaithful, to the fearful because it's a risk they are not willing to take. They take the Lord's talent and bury it in the ground, giving him no return, no trust in return for the trust that he gave them. So don't fall in that category. This is the curse that comes as a result. The 19th verse, Moses says to God, Please pardon the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your steadfast love, just as you've forgiven this people from Egypt until now. And the Lord God said, I have pardoned according to your word. And what they are literally talking about was God said, I will destroy them right now. They will all die right here. And Moses said, please don't kill all of them. And God allows them to live. But, says the Lord, truly, as I live, and as all the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord, not one of the men who have seen my glory and my signs that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and still have put me to the test these ten times and have not obeyed my voice, not one of them shall see the land that I swore to give to their fathers. That's the curse. Because they saw his glory and his signs in Egypt, in the wilderness, and they've tested him ten times over already and not obeyed his voice. Because of this, they will not see the land that was sworn to their fathers. 26th verse, the Lord spoke to Moses also and Aaron, how long will this wicked congregation grumble against me? That's a whole lesson to itself. How long will this wicked congregation grumble against me? And there is a lot of grumbling. The churches today are like the church at that time. 
which is the congregation. The churches are certainly capable of grumbling. How long? I've heard the grumblings of the people of Israel, which they grumble against me. The idea that they're mad at Moses and Aaron is not true. They're mad at God. And when God says, it's not Moses and Aaron you have a problem with, it's me. He's the author of that idea. God said this first, before the people came and accused Moses and Aaron of taking too much on themselves. It was always about this. Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord, what you have said in my hearing, I will do to you. Your dead bodies will fall in this wilderness. All of your number listed in the census from 20 years old and upward who have grumbled against me. Not one will come into the land where I swore that I would make you dwell, except for Caleb and Joshua. Your children will be shepherds in the wilderness 40 years and will suffer because of your faithful, faithlessness until the last of your dead bodies lies in the wilderness. According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, 40 days, a year for each day, you will bear your iniquity. 40 years, you will know my displeasure. I, the Lord, have spoken. Surely this I will do to all this wicked congregation who are gathered together against me. In this wilderness, they will come to a full end. There they will die. Already in Numbers 14, the Lord says, they grumble against me. The congregation is wicked and gathered together against me. Already, the Lord is saying this. The problem is not with Moses and Aaron. They are handy. They're nearby. <laughs> Easy targets. But the truth is, they're upset with God. The people are upset with God. And we have lots of handy targets and preachers and elders and uh, our own brethren sit next to us. But basically all of our grumbling and all of our complaints are with the Lord. We should not be fooled about this matter. 36 to 38 of Numbers 14 continues. The men whom Moses sent to spy out the land who returned and made all the congregation grumble against him by bringing up a bad report about the land, the men who brought up the bad report of the land, they died by plague before the Lord. Of those men who went to spy out the land, only Joshua and Caleb remained alive. So immediately, when the spies come back, they bring this evil report saying, we can't do it. The people believe that report instead of the encouragement of Caleb and Joshua that the Lord, all we need to do is make God happy and God will give it to us. They decided we're going to get another leader and we're going to go back to Egypt. Well, why did God part the Red Sea? Why did why all of the plagues and the signs, all the things that he did for them? What about water from the rock? Why go back to Egypt? So these who brought this, and as it says, made the whole congregation grumble against God. Yeah, they have blood on their hands. They're responsible for discouraging the people. They died before the Lord by plague. God made it very clear that these spies did evil. The next thing that happens, the Lord is not among you. The people come back, 39 to 42. Moses told these words to them. The people mourned greatly. They rose early in the morning. The next morning went up to the heights of the hill country and said, here we are. We will go up to the place the Lord has promised, for we have sinned. And so now they said, okay, we've heard about this curse, and we've heard about this 40 years, and that doesn't sound like a very good deal. 
So we would like to um, come back to the table here and uh, see if we can negotiate a better deal from God, right? Uh, no. Moses said, why now transgress the command of the Lord? That's not going to succeed. Which means the strategy is not to transgress the command of the Lord. The strategy is to do the command of the Lord. Don't go up. The Lord is not among you, lest you be struck down before your enemies. The Lord is not among you, he said. Don't go up. You will die. You can't take it on your own. It has to be God who does it. But they presumed to go up to the heights of the hill country. Although neither the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord nor Moses departed out of the camp. And at that point, the Amalekites and Canaanites who lived in the hill country came down and defeated them and pursued them as far as Hormah. The Lord, oops, sorry, stop for a minute. So people are dying now. They're attacking a land which God told them not to do. Ah, oh, but he'd been telling us to go into that process. Yes, he had. But then you refused to go and wanted to appoint a leader to take you all the way back to Egypt. And for the people who encouraged you and said, God is with us, don't rebel, you said to stone them. So, yes, the Lord is not with them. And yes, they now are going to be defeated by the inhabitants of the land because God's not with them. Why, why is this happening? Because they refuse to obey the Lord. They refuse to trust him. He trusted them, if you will, or entrusted them with this heritage, bringing them out of Egypt, giving them the words of the covenant, giving them his servant Moses. They should have made a return on that investment. Enough faith to go into the promised land, but they did not. Then Numbers 15. Remember, we're still, this is all before Korah. This is before Korah stands up and says, everybody can be a priest. Numbers 15, 37 to 41, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the people of Israel, tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations. Put a cord of blue on the tassel of each corner. What is this? National pride? Identity politics? No. There's a specific reason for this. It will be a tassel for you to look at and remember all the commandments of the Lord to do them, not to follow after your own heart and your own eyes, which you are inclined to whore after. So you shall remember and do all my commandments and be holy to God I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord, your God. And the very next verse is number 16.1. Now, Korah, son of Izhar, son of Kohath, son of Levi, Dathan, and Byram, sons of Eliab, and On, son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men and rose up before Moses with a number of the people of Israel, 250 chiefs of the congregation, chosen from the assembly, well-known men. And they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said, You have gone too far. All in the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? That's how you got to number 16. So the reason for this, I mean, the reason for studying it in this way, understand this was going to be a problem from a long time ago. They were complaining 10 times over in the wilderness. That faithlessness is the reason they didn't go in. They failed to trust God. 
Remember what God said to them about the tassel. It's there to remind you to keep God's commands, all of them, and not follow your own heart and your own eyes, which you are inclined to whore after. It, it, it is your inclination, he said, you, your go-to in some sense, what you typically do, what has been observed in this, in this generation is you follow your own heart and your own eyes. But we walk by faith, not by sight. You see? Faith is the substance of things unseen. Remember to do these. Be holy. I am the Lord who brought you out of Egypt to be your God. Even though they're condemned and they're going to wander in the wilderness 40 years and he is not with them to enter the promised land at this time. They're defeated before their enemies. He nonetheless says, you are to keep my commandments and I am to be your God. And you shall be reminded don't do what you think is right. Don't look around you and make decisions based on what you see. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. This is the context in which Korah gets up and says, you know what, Moses and Aaron, you take too much on yourselves. All the congregation can serve as priests, not just the tribe of Levi. And it is perhaps I hope it is the point of the lesson is it should be very clear to you that they have no problem reading Korah and his group they have no problem understanding what had been said understanding what the scriptures contained what the commandment was that there is but one tribe and that God has chosen Aaron and his sons as the priests that is in no way unclear in the text, and it is in no way unclear in their mind. That is not the problem. The problem is they don't trust God. They are afraid. This is a problem of fear. Fear and doubt are the opposite of faith. Trusting God is what we're called to do. But the big picture there is these men arose because they did not like the outcome. They refused to take the promised land in their cowardice and in their failure to understand that God was the one who would fight the battles and it didn't depend on their own strength. They're looking at how big the people are and how big the cities are and it doesn't matter. That's irrelevant. If God has decided that that is yours, it's yours. It's not you who overcome with your own strength, your own power. It's God who overcomes. But they chose to walk according to sight, to make judgments according to what they can see and lay eyes on. People do this. It's a great temptation for us. And so when they stood up and said, hey, you, you take too much upon yourselves. The Lord is with, the Lord is, is among them. Well, remember Moses said, don't go up, you'll die. The Lord is not among you. Korah stands up and says, the Lord is among you. The Lord is among them. It's you who are wrong, Moses. That's what's happening. So no, it's not a failure to understand, not a lack of clarity. Um, it's not that they seem to think that Moses is dishonest or has done some evil or some wrong in his life. No, that's not there. It's just this. You have gone too far. You exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord. And these are the accusations that we read last week. So you, you guys presume to have drafted a settled creed for all time. No, just reading the Bible. You know, you guys think that it's a simple matter of right and wrong and that we should be governed by this simple decision. Yes, 
Of course. Why would it be otherwise? No one lives by such a neat rule, they said. Nobody, nobody, that simplicity is beguiling. But, mm, no, that's what you think about it, but that's not what the Bible says. You can know what's right. And these are the accusations that they make. And it's exactly what Korah, Dathan, and Abiram said. Will you put out the eyes of these men? All this, again, is intended to show how we got here. What happened? Um, in the open fellowship movement, you will hear them say that we have to judge biblical clarity or we have to judge the intentions of my brother. Is he sincere? Is he honest? These things are just not true. That's what you invent when you leave the idea that the Bible can be understood. And if you don't think that you can trust God to get you to the promised land, then no amount of military strength or schooling is going to get you there. And things that should be obvious will not stay obvious. It will become a problem. And you have Korah as an indication of what can happen. Because they were afraid to take the promised land. And because they did not believe that God would give it to them. They doubted his word. Even though the text is very plain about who can be a priest, they dismissed the text. You see that? The Bible was there, and it said what it said, and it was very clear. They just didn't care what it said. They dismissed it, saying, well, Moses and Aaron made that up. I mean, of course they would say that it could only be Aaron. It's convenient for these members of the tribe of Levi to say that. And so all of that is... Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit inspired those words, not the human spirit of Moses and Aaron. That's why they can't be forgiven. They don't believe, and they can't believe, and they can't be saved without belief. But this is what's happening. They're saying, well, yeah, I know what it says. I mean, I know what's written down there, but Moses, you wrote that down. They just don't trust that the Bible is real. They don't trust that it can be understood. As soon as that's gone, all bets are off. You let that one go, anything that anybody does is just fine. doesn't matter. You would like to think that it does, and they'll protest that it does, but no, it doesn't. You can see. You see who they have in gospel meetings. You see what they allow in the practices of the members. Anything goes. So we'll have to talk about this at more length another time. Today, if you are not a Christian, you need to put your trust in God that he can get you through this life. He can get you through your trials. You can be right with him. And yes, you have your own strength and you'll be called upon to use it in his service. And that's good. But your own strength is not enough to overcome. God will help you. You have his word. You'll have the mediation of his son on your behalf. And your strategy is to please God. You cannot possibly anticipate everything that's coming. You cannot know what is going to happen or what you are going to face. You cannot have the schooling the technique, the whatever it takes to beat everything on your own. You have to rely on God that he'll see you through it. But that trust is never misplaced. God is well able to overcome it. If today you are not a Christian, become a Christian and get the power of God in your life that you might be forgiven, that you might have heaven when life is done. If today you are already a Christian but have not lived right, repent 
put your trust in God again, come back to him, he will forgive. If you see anything in the text, you see that he forgives constantly. Anybody who repents will be able to come back to him. So by all means, reach out to God from your distress and he will hear you. If we can help you with our prayers, we will. Please let your need be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected.